Um, today, um, today I'm with uh, Anna Lope. Uh, my name is Daniel J. Fernanda Guevara. Um, and today is December uh, 11th, um, 2020. Um, and this interview is being conducted for the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program of the University of Florida's Pandemic Collection. All right, so Anna, how did you find out about COVID? When did you first hear of, of COVID-19? Um, I think it, go back, it goes back as long as even January or February. Um, as a microbiology student at the University of Florida, um, it was especially mentioned uh, before it be even became um, a danger to the United States. Um, by January, February, um, all the professors were bringing it up in classes. I remember in my um, food microbiology program, uh, in one of my classes, a professor actually uh, came up with an assignment and we had to, um, based on uh, the MERS and prior um, SARS uh, pandemics from 2002 and 2012, I believe, uh, we had to figure out if it was um, something that could potentially have been uh, passed on to humans um, by food. So we actually became very involved with um, COVID from the very beginning and very aware of what was coming and the dangers that it could bring, fortunately. So at some, to some extent, I was very aware, but that's something that only, I believe only people in that environment and that um, research um, environment uh, would have noticed. What was your reaction then, initial reaction in a sense, both personally and you know, as a student, because you were in school, um, what was your initial reaction? Well, initially, I remember looking at the numbers and seeing um, uh, from when it first started appearing in Europe and Italy and Spain, uh, because at first you hear about it and you know it's in China and it's in Asia and it's starting to expand, but you never really feel it as close as when you know you hear the first cases in California, the first cases in Washington, first cases in New York. So when I did see that it was coming, I never thought it was going to get uh, to the extent it's gotten. I remember I, I was a senior, um, so I thought, well, my senior semester, it, uh, my last semester of senior year is gone. But I really did think that by fall semester, everything was going to be back to normal and look at us starting uh, spring semester again, quarantined almost a year later. When did you, when did you, and I mean, maybe you didn't think it was serious, right? Um, when did, what was that moment where you either came to the conclusion that it was serious or that it, or that it, or that it wasn't? Um, I don't know if I can pinpoint an exact moment because um, from the very beginning, as I was telling you, I was very on top of the news and very on top of everything that was happening. So it wasn't really a surprise or just a eureka moment where I thought, oh, like this is serious. Um, but that, like I was telling you, when I started um, hearing about Spain quarantining completely, Italy quarantining completely, and um, New York, um, just everyone inside, don't come out. Um, only health workers, only people working um, at essential services were going outside. I thought, this is crazy. It's really um, going to take a toll on us if we don't act immediately. Okay. How has, um, how has COVID-19 impacted you, in a sense, your family members, uh, people, you know, friends, um, uh, activities? that you belong to a professional, professionally. Um, tell me a little bit how it's impacted you personally. Well, um, um, starting from the point of um, being affected by COVID, I am lucky enough, one of the few people lucky enough to haven't had anyone in her immediate family or um, 
friend group be affected by it um, considerably. I do have friends, I do have family members that have gotten it. My sister got COVID, my 10 month old um, um, niece got COVID. Um, but fortunately enough, everyone has been, um, has recovered, everyone as well. And unlike many Americans and many people around the globe, um, I don't know anyone personally that has died of COVID. Uh, but beyond that, in my life, um, I was just starting a master's program um, this uh, fall semester. And because of COVID um, completely, I'm taking, I did the entire semester um, online. I just finished yesterday. And uh, for spring semester, we will be doing a hybrid. So because some professors expressed their concern, um, they will not be teaching in person, but others will. So I'm basically doing half and half, um, half on campus, half outside. But beyond that, yeah, um, I was planning to go on a trip to Europe this summer. That's not happening. Uh, but well, it's fine. Those are things that will come in the future. I'm not really worried about my life. I understand that however COVID might have affected me um, in my social life and my the things I had planned, um, staying inside and being safe is way more important. So I'm not really, um, I don't really mind staying in. I, I don't really know how to express it. Um, I would much rather be safe and be a responsible um, citizen. What has been then, so you don't mind staying indoors, but what, what is, if you look at your life right now, and you look at your life the week before COVID even became a word <laughs> mm -hmm. that was bandied about. What are what are the biggest, most drastic, um, you know, impacts of of COVID on on your daily life, on on life in general? Right. Well, um, then I it should be about January. Um, I remember going out with my friends, uh, going to restaurants. Um, I was in Gainesville. Uh, uh, as a student there, I'm not there anymore. But yeah, just sharing. I because of because I was in Gainesville, I wasn't really um, close to my grandparents or any family members that could potentially be at risk. So um, that part wasn't as impacted. Now I can't go, or I limit the amount of times I go see um, my family members that could potentially become compromised uh, by COVID. Um, I. Either when I don't go or when I go, I make sure to wear a mask. The first time I, the first thing they tell me when I go inside is like, wash your hands. Um, or like, do you want to wash your clothes? I'm like, no grandma, I'm okay. <laughs> but it is very nice um, to see that they're very conscious, extremely conscious of what has to uh, be done. As a microbiology student, I'm very glad that I've taught them well. And they're more than, yeah, more than aware of what they have to do. So, I mean, as long as they're protected, I don't mind washing my hands as many times as um, I have to. What about the issue of washing hands? And as you bring a, a particularly interesting uh, point of view to the interview because, you know, it seems like the information at the beginning, whenever you discover one of these pandemics, is the scientists are not gonna know everything, right? So people were very concerned about wiping surfaces. Now they seem to be less so. The whole mask wearing issue. What have you noticed given your training about the kind of, the way that, um, you know, safety has been, not only that, that information has been disseminated, but how you have kind of engaged with this information? Yeah, I'm very glad that you bring up that point because um, as a microbiologist in an environment where absolutely no one knows about microbiology, like my family member, they don't really understand. Uh, they can't separate a bacteria from a virus. So they're like, eh. Uh, but uh, I have noticed definitely that at the beginning, everyone was like, um, oh yeah, let's clean up. And then as time has gone, um, people have become more relaxed, but I feel it's because people don't really understand how research and advancements in 
COVID uh, knowledge goal. Because at the beginning, I remember um, Dr. Fauci saying, oh, like you have to do this and that. And then as we gather mo more knowledge and as we see different things, science can change. And it's not completely black and white. I have arguments about this with my dad constantly. He says, oh, they don't, know, they don't know what they're talking about. At the beginning they say this and then they say that. And I'm like, well, dad, um, 400 years ago, we didn't know the earth was um, round and then they changed their mind <laughs> So, because science advances. So of course, COVID is something so recent that yeah, you can map the genetic code for um, COVID. I think we mapped it by like January 10, but you don't know how it acts. Like you can know a lot about it, but not until a given amount of time has passed, you don't really know. Um, how to behave and honestly if we don't know anything um because i may have a degree in microbiology but i don't know anything in comparison to the people um leading us through this pandemic or the experts leading us <laughs> trying to lead us through this pandemic so um even i don't know it and if you don't know anything about it, the last thing you, the first thing you should do and the only thing you should do is just comply with what they're trying to um, tell you and inform you about. They're not changing their mind. They're just gathering more information and seeing how things actually work. Nothing is black and white. Um, we didn't have COVID and all of a sudden we knew absolutely everything about it and how to act and how to proceed. So um, from that point of view, it's been uh, very frustrating for me because um, people can be very hard headed, but, and I, just, I think that just because we've changed or the people um, in power have changed um, um, the way that, or the recommendations towards leading with um, COVID, um, uh, leaving with COVID, a lot of people have become um, kind of, uh, they don't really care or they don't really um, comply with anything because as excuse, oh, they don't really know, they don't even know what they're doing. So why should I comply tomorrow? They're gonna do something, say something differently. And then I am, everything I've done so far is going to be for nothing. So, uh, I feel like from that point of view, it's been very difficult to deal with, but um, I mean, all I care about are my grandparents and them being safe, so, and they're very good students. So like, I talk to them every day and I tell them, oh, are, are you doing this? Yeah, 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 I'm doing that. And like, they don't even go outside to, to the supermarket. So for me, that's all I care about. And my, my parents, I know there's a danger, but um, they're also trying to comply. I mean, I force them to, <laughs> and they, they're not really, um, they're very responsible as well, so they're gonna be fine. But beyond that, honestly, I tried to fight it I, at the very beginning, but it was very frustrating. So people are responsible for themselves and they might not know what they're doing, but <laughs> I can't do anything about it, unfortunately. What about now in the holidays? What, um, you know, uh, typically, you know, Latinos, Latinas on the holidays get together, you know, and in, in large numbers, what, what do you see as, as a pot, as, as a threat for your own family? Right. And, and, and do you worry about that? Do you worry about, um now the end of the year for your own family personally yeah 100 percent um as you said my family always goes completely out during christmas um we gather and from um if it's possible um from the 24th to the 31st and we all stay at one house for seven days <laughs> because we live in different parts of florida so we all try to go there it, this year of course, it's not going to be possible. Um, but I mean, I'm sure we will do something to uh, reduce levels, definitely. And I'm very um, happy, at least with my family, um, 
we're not in comparison to other uh, families. My immediate family is not extremely big and we're only like four cousins and none of us have children. And it's like two aunts and that's it and my grandparents. So, and everyone has been extremely responsible. Most of, uh, most of us work, at, uh, I study at home and my cousins work from home. So everyone has been extremely responsible. And I know that at least from them, I can trust that they haven't been um, irresponsible. And in fact, uh, one of them is, <laughs> she's worse than me, she's a nurse. So she knows as well. And she's even worse than me with my grandparents and my, and my mom and my aunts. So from that point of view, I'm also scared that, okay, I don't go out, I don't do any, anything irresponsible. But at some points I have, well, I've gotten tested for COVID four times already. So even when you are very responsible, not necessarily everyone that surrounds you is responsible. So um, I am aware that I could um, potentially bring in something um, to my grandparents, but now that you mention it, I think it would be wise to at least get tested uh, before going up to their house. That brings me to the next question I didn't have, which is this issue of testing, right? So we've all mm -hmm. seen that testing is not um, is not uniform for everybody, right? So because I am a graduate student at the University of Florida, I scheduled a test, I was tested the next day, and I had my results within three days, right? My mother received an exam, a test, and she it took her six weeks to get the results. So what is what have your experiences been or your family's experience if you could speak to that with testing have they been you know um you know how would you categorize them um i feel i have gotten tested as i mentioned before four times throughout the pandemic and they have all been at very different times the most recent was this week actually and um yeah i got this week i got my result back um about two days later and that was, that was nice. Uh, but I have had to wait almost two weeks at some point during the, the pandemic. And it's kind of um, frustrating because um, for myself, it's, it doesn't really matter because I'm a student. But for example, I do understand the concerns from people that have to work or, I mean, if you're waiting for a test result that might take two weeks, then is it really worth get, even getting tested? Because by the time that you got your results, your the virus is most likely gone. I mean, the period for the virus is 10 to 14 days. If you have to wait 14 days just for the results and take into account that you probably got infected a few days before you got tested, that's more than 14 days. Does that mean you have to quarantine for another 15 days? You know, it's very it's a very controversial topic. And definitely it is not something that should be occurring, uh, the length of period that people have to wait. Um, I feel that it really depends on the stage in the pandemic that people have been getting tested. Um, I feel like the resources that are being um, given for testing for the pandemic, the more people that you have working in it, the, of course, um, the quicker the results are going to be ready. I, have, uh, I actually have friends that work at the Jackson Microbiology Department And they're the ones doing the testing for Jackson and they are completely overwhelmed. Um, they're all working over our um, extra time and they're not hiring. <laughs> I actually, I, um, as a microbiologist, I, app I applied um, for them now because uh, I was planning to work during the um, at, uh, microbio department as I was doing my master's program. Then I changed my mind. But um, They're actually not hiring. They're so it's it's really sad to see these situations come up because of a lack of um, either money give, being given to um, uh, expand those resources or just an unwillingness to help. But in either case, um, it's something that definitely, as I was saying, depends on the stage in the pandemic, the test that you're getting the the absolutely everything and 
it's something that we should be getting like the day after. It's not something we should be having to wait. And not because of being desperate. It's because there is, you know, people have to work. People have to um, uh, feed their families, basically. So you, a lot of people, fortunately, I don't have to deal with that. But a lot of people uh, would much rather not even get tested. And I was just having that um, discussion with one of my friends. Um, he was saying, if I know I'm, I'm, I have COVID, why should I even wait? That, that's just... Um, going to put me in this bureaucratic process of having to go through i mean i might as well just tell my boss oh i have covid and that's it <laughs> so um yeah it's something that in my opinion hasn't been handled well and um it's something maybe it's too late to try to figure it out now i hope not <laughs> By the way, when you mentioned Jackson, and because this is an interview, you meant Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami, yeah, Florida, Jackson right? Memorial okay. Florida. Okay, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> All right, so this um, let's talk about education, right? Because you are at that point. How old are you? Twenty-two. Twenty-two years of age, and this is supposed to be the point where you go from college to a career right or to or to graduate school and take me through that process how did uh you know as a former gator um chomp chomp how <laughs> did um how did the not only the university but uh, uh, how did the university deal with the pandemic right and how did COVID changed the way you were educated. Um, right. Right. Well, I, um, this is a topic a lot of people are passionate about. <laughs> um, so as a graduating Gator from um, spring 2020, I didn't have a graduation. And I know for a fact, um, some of my friends graduating this semester are also not having a graduation, which I mean, it's something symbolic, I understand. I mean. I'd much rather not have a graduation anyways, because I don't want to be in a, in a closed um, place with, I don't know, uh, 5,000 people. But um, I do think there's a prioritization of interest by the school. Um, I don't really know how to word it, uh, but Definitely, I at first I received an email, oh, your graduation has been postponed um, to August. And then after August, I had already ordered my cabin gown, I had ordered absolutely everything. I canceled that because I thought I'm not even going to be in Gainesville um, by August. So yeah, by then I had completely um, dismissed the idea of having a graduation or attending my graduation. Then we received another email, oh, your, your graduation is going to be in December. And then by the end, we just got another email saying, yeah, you, you can attend whatever graduation we have eventually. So um, from that point of view, it's uh, kind of uh, disappointing. But I mean, I'm not a person that uh, direct, I'm directly involved in how to deal with that. So I don't really, I can't really do anything. Uh, from the the question you were saying, uh, how it has affected my my academic life. Well, I I I'm a, I was a pre med student at the University of Florida. I I was supposed to take the MCAT this summer. Um, that was completely um, ruined. I'm actually supposed to take it this um, this January, but some students have already been getting emails saying that um, they have to postpone their. Um, their appointment because either the states have very high um, infection rates and they're they don't feel safe or yeah even and it's incredible because this was happening in March April in June of la May and June of last year and to think that it, this has extended up until February of a year later literally a year later um, it's crazy. But um, I mean, any, any measures that are taken to keep us safe, it's unfortunate that we have to 
go through this, but any measures that are done to keep us safe, I, I'm pretty sure, um, at least in the world of pre-medicine and medical school applications, um, it's something that is fortunately being considered by the medical school, then they are more than understanding of the situation that is going on. So of course we're um, from, as far as I know, from their perspective, they're being very considerate and very understanding of the situation. What about the transition to online instruction? Um, mm -hmm. I know that, uh, you know, it's not for everybody. How, how have, how have you engaged with online instruction? Well, fortunately, um, my, the microbiology department at UF relies heavily on hybrid courses, even before the pandemic. So um, I remember in fall of senior year, I took, I only had two classes in person. I took um, microbiology lab, advanced lab for microbio students. And I had physics too, which isn't even uh, a microbiology course. And then my other two classes were completely online and they were microbiology specific courses. So when I actually got um, to spring semester, I only had one class in person, even before COVID. So by the time COVID came in, I, I only had that one class transition. And my professor for that class definitely um, had difficulty adapting, but um, fortunately uh, they understand us and we understand them. And <laughs> we're both the victims of this situation. So we're very, Right. So like, there's really no hard feelings towards each other. We both understand. And I'm very, I'm very grateful for um, the attitudes they've had and uh, how considered they've been towards us. What about family members with kids? Is, has it been, has that been a challenge for, for your family? Um, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was the, I was the youngest grandchild up until two years ago. So from that point of view, I don't have my only, um, well, my sister is on um, my dad's family, uh, but both my nephews are three years old and about a year old. So they don't really go to school. And um, my other niece uh, on my mom's side, where the one I was the baby of until two years ago, mm -hmm. um, she is four years old. So neither one of them, um, none of the three were in school before COVID started. So um, actually my, my aunt was taking care of my little niece before COVID. She's been taking care of her for like two years. So once COVID started, my, my sister uh, got my two, my, my two nephews to have my aunt take care of them as well. So we've all just handled it in the family. But yeah, fortunately, fortunately, they don't have to go to school or anything like that. But I do know I have um, my dad's um, cousin asked me to have um, their child. She's like in third or fourth grade. And they, they knew I was in Miami now. And they asked me if I could um, not tutor her child. But, you know, whenever she was in classes, go, like be there with her and help her out because both her parents had to work. They're in the health field. So, of course, they couldn't miss um work and I couldn't do it because my program is very um I have, I have classes all day so I couldn't really do it but I do know that they had difficulty um, struggling with that I think she started school a few months ago already um in like October but yeah I don't really know how they dealt with that first month but of course I, that was something they would be able to do because they had the money for it. But a lot of people, um, I am well aware that a lot of people just had to leave their job because they had to care for their children because you can't just leave children there. <laughs> How about the financial um, a hardship of COVID? Has COVID brought to your family any financial hardship or any, um, as a result, you know, missing work? um having to pay for tests uh you know so on and so forth 
Yeah, well, personally, um, because no one in my family has um, become ill with COVID, uh, or becoming, um, uh, having COVID, maybe like, yeah, my sister and my, my niece, um, two people, but that's it. And my sister um, was just working from home, even when she was sick, uh, which was very difficult because working from home, from home with two children, three years old and one year old was extremely challenging. She was driving herself crazy. Uh, but at least she wasn't struggling from the financial point. I mean, she could deal with it. I do know I am a volunteer. I, um, it hasn't touched me personally, but I am a volunteer with a program called um, Contra COVID and it's based in New Jersey actually. And it's meant for immigrant families um, that are, because they don't have insurance, a lot of times they might be scared to even go get tested because they don't know what the repercussions might be. So in that program, what we seek to do is inform them of what they can do. We call them every now and then to make sure they don't have any symptoms. We do screenings on them. And if they do have some symptoms, we tell them, look, you have to go, nothing's gonna happen. You don't even have to um, give any personal information beyond your name. And based on that, they do go and get tested. And in case that they do, uh, they are positive, we put them in contact with certain clinics and like um, charity organizations that they could access um, for free and not have to pay. But from them, I do know that most of them aren't working uh, because first of all, they work in industries that are not um, essential. So whenever COVID start, uh, people started getting tight, um, they were just fired. Um, second of all, they have children at home that uh, are less than 10, many of them uh, have children, two or three children that are less than 10 years old. So they have to take care of them and they have to prep meals for them. and have them um, go to class and actually um, not miss class because they can be at home and miss class. You know, children are not very responsible. So from then, um, I always ask them, oh, are you currently working? Because it's a risk for COVID. Mm -hmm. And most of them, it's heartbreaking because most of them aren't working. And most of them, sometimes they even bring it up to me and they say, oh, do you know of any help that um, any of these organizations might be offering because I'm behind in rent? Uh, and it's crazy. It's really saddening that something like this is happening. Um, I am, pri I am, and my family is privileged enough to have not been affected directly by this economically or um, in terms of health. But this has definitely taken a toll on millions of Americans, and it's very unfortunate and very. Um, difficult so i i can just hope it doesn't it hasn't affected me but i i cannot wait for this to be over because it's it's not only affecting me you know it's it's horrible for a lot of people how did you find out about this organization contra covid yeah um actually i am in a massive facebook um group for pre-med students applying to college you know we, we can be very competitive, but we're also very <laughs> supportive of each other. So it's competition with love. <laughs> and we have like this massive page with like 40,000 students and constantly people are adding info from like organizations that they're creating and things like that. And this was actually, I remember, I don't even remember when I signed up for it. I saw it and I like gave my email and like three months later, they sent me an email saying, oh, Anna, this is, so and so from uh, this organization, you signed up. Um, do you want to meet for a Spanish interview? Because um, since we're dealing with um, Latin American immigrants, and I was like, of course. Uh, it's an organization created by medical students at Harvard, I believe. So it's uh, they're in great hands, and they're very, um, very passionate and uh, compassionate people. So I'm just glad I'm, I can be a part of it. And then, and then what do you do? You just speak to, do you speak to people via Zoom, giving them information? Is that? Is no, we actually, um, we are um, uh, kind of like a sister organization to another organization in New Jersey 
um, called Cosecha, which is for um, um, Latin American um, undocumented immigrants. So um, they put us in contact with the people that belong to that organization. And we have them as, um, as I mean, they don't, the people that we get do not necessarily belong to them, but a big percentage of um, the people that we talk to are members of Cosecha. So yeah, we just call them, depending on how, how at risk we believe they are, we have a program that sets them at different, um, you know, two weeks, we'll call you two weeks from now or a month from now or two months from now. It really depends on whether that person is working, whether that person um, has children that are going to school. In New Jersey, they aren't. Um, whether, you know, they have high um, uh, risk of, of becoming severely ill because they have comorbidities such as diabetes or high blood pressure or, you know, they're immunocompromised. So it really depends on their profile. And based on that, we call them at different times of the month to make sure they're fine and in case that they need any help, um, we can give it to them. We do have a, a healthcare team, I believe. I am not qualified for that, but the people in med school are handling that so they can give them health information. I can't do that and my knowledge is very limited. <laughs> um, okay. Um how and i'm not going to take up too much more of your time i just want to ask maybe one, one or two more questions and thank you for doing the interview um for agreeing to do the interview um how so other than all the stuff and it seems like you have a big plate so i, I can almost imagine what the answer to this question is going to be but um how has um covid impacted your ability to um, to participate in social movements. So, for example, if you belong to a church, you know, belong to the church. If you're involved politically or a, a soup kitchen or uh, anything, how has it how has it impacted your ability to participate in social movements? Right. Well, um, as a as a person in the pre health field because it's not really health yet. Um, I have, as you were saying, I was very, especially at UF, I was very active in different organizations and different um, volu uh, volunteering programs that provided for either um, kids with um, special disabilities or, you know, at the hospital at Shands, I was a volunteer there as well. At I don't know what the complete name of the hospital for chance. Yes. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, but, uh, from that point of view, that was completely cut out. Uh, but here at, in in Miami, I am a part of different organizations like uh, Fitting South Florida that have become extremely important um, for COVID, during COVID. I mean, they existed before, but now that we're in such a dire situation for so many people. Um, we cannot, <laughs> you know, just disappear. It's even, even more important to step up and um, participate. So from that point of view, since I moved here, everything that I was doing over there was um, canceled. But since I came here, I've sought to get involved in organizations that can still contribute um, during COVID. Uh, from I'm not I don't go to church uh, even before COVID so that hasn't been something um, that has affected me I do know people that have in New Jersey uh, from my calls uh, yeah a lot of them uh, haven't been able to go to church I know I know you're very happy about this because you're from New Jersey <laughs> so um, yeah I talk to them and they're all very like oh yes don't worry um I'm Every time I just go out to the supermarket and to church <laughs> and I always wear my mask and I'm like, okay, that's good. Uh, how do you feed, how do you feed uh, people in need or help special needs kids in times of COVID? What, what, how has the pandemic changed the way that 
that organization your you know what i mean like the organizations you joined in miami mm-hmm. how do you know how they're doing if they're doing their work any differently um i'm not quite sure because i was in here before um covid right. but i do know it's like a food pantry and people basically come in in cars and we just give them out like whole boxes of food um it's mostly food for kids um you know juices um Compota, I don't know the name. Yeah, how do you say compota in English? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it can 100% help. I have, I mean, not right now, but in the past, when I had just migrated to the United States, my family was one to benefit from these kinds of um, distributions of food. I remember, we're not religious, and we used to go to a church um, that would give out food, um, Doing, you know, uh, for Thanksgiving or for Christmas, they would always give out turkey and things like that. And my family, I'm telling you, uh, we didn't eat gravy or anything like that because we're, <laughs> we're, we're Hispanic. But even then we would go and we would, um, you know, because sometimes situation is very difficult that anything can help. So I am very glad that I'm not in that situation yet. I can still help other people because I've been in that situation and I know what it is like to be a kid and be at home now with COVID. It's even worse. Be at home and be bored and be hungry and go to the fridge and there's nothing. So um, it's very gratifying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's very gratifying to be able to kind of give back and be able to help. I know it's not significant where we're doing, but it's it's a little something. I disagree. I, I would say. I mean, it's very I mean, it's it's not significant to the extent of yeah, we're not solving child hunger, but it's you know, it's we're making it a little better for everyone. Has there been an uptick in the number of 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 people using the food pantry since, you know, since you've been, in, um, or has it remained about the oh, same? No. no, definitely. It feels like it's Thanksgiving break every, day, every weekend. It's, um, again, I can't really compare from before, but it's right. very, very busy. Like all resources go out every weekend. Well, Antelope, thank you so much for the interview. Is there Thank anything else before me. I go, before I go, is there anything else that you would like to say that before uh, I end the interview? No, just that um, as a reflection of this um, conversation that hopefully we'd have to wait another year <laughs> to have the situation solved and that um, hopefully now the vaccines give me a lot of hope and that's something we can look um, forward to. And yeah, nothing more. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Anna. Bye.